the Capitol attack one year later. We're not gonna take it anymore. We're gonna walk down to the Capitol. We remember the deadly insurrection. How the blank could something like this happen? Is this America? President Trump was sitting in the dining room next to the Oval Office watching on television. Look at the lies that fueled the assault. The big lie has driven states across the country to enact new laws to make it harder for people to vote. And continue today. Those involved must be held accountable. Plus. So at this moment, we must decide what kind of nation are we going to be? Can the great American experiment endure? Next. This is Washington Week. Corporate funding is provided by... For 25 years, Consumer Cellular's goal has been to provide wireless service that helps people communicate and connect. We offer a variety of no-contract plans, and our U.S.-based customer service team can help find one that fits you. To learn more, visit ConsumerCellular.tv. Additional funding is provided by... The Estate of Arnold Adams. Ku and Patricia Ewan through the Ewan Foundation committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson, Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves, Robert and Susan Rosenbaum, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Once again, from Washington, moderator Yamish Alcindor. Good evening and welcome to Washington Week. It's been one year and one day since the January 6th Capitol attack. Washington remains deeply scarred by the attempted coup. And so many in the nation remain rocked by bitter, enduring partisanship. Over the past year, former President Trump has continued to spread lies about the 2020 election. On Thursday, on the anniversary of the violence, President Biden addressed the nation from Statutory Hall in the Capitol, the scene of the crime. The former president of the United States of America has created and spread a web of lies about the 2020 election. You can't love your country only when you win. You can't obey the law only when it's convenient. You can't be patriotic when you embrace and enable lies. In a statement, former President Trump responded that President Biden was engaged in, quote, political theater. Trump also wrote, quote, the Democrats want to own this day of January 6th so they can stoke fears and divide America. Congresswoman Liz Cheney, the vice chair of the committee investigating January 6th, called out her Republican colleagues for downplaying the riot. Trump loyalists, though, Representatives Matt Gates and Marjorie Taylor Greene, quickly fired back. They ought to be ashamed of themselves, and, and history is watching, and history will judge them. Seize We're the ashamed day. of Se nothing. Seize the day. We're proud of the work that we yeah. did on January 6th to That's make right. legitimate arguments about election integrity. Tonight, joining me are four reporters who wrote the first draft of this chapter of American history. Zolan Kanu Youngs, White House correspondent for The New York Times. Carol Lenig. Washington Post investigative reporter. She is the co-author of the book, I Alone Can Fix It, Donald J. Trump's Catastrophic Final Year. Ryan J. Riley, senior justice reporter for HuffPost. He is also working on a book about the January 6th insurrection. And Jake Sherman, founder of the political newsletter, Punchbowl News, and co-author of the book, The Hill to Die On. Thank you so much, all of you, for joining us remotely as we continue to deal with the pandemic. Jake, I want to start first with you. Um, you were there at the Capitol. You saw the, the insurrectionists, the, the rioters break into the Capitol. What sticks with you about that day? And also, talk about the lingering trauma that, that is impacting people who work in that building, lawmakers and staffers and, of course, reporters. Well, Yamiche, I'll start with your second question, which I think is the most important one, which is impo it's important to keep in mind that tens of thousands of people uh, get come into the Capitol every day. Many of them are not political people. Many of them are construction workers, electricians, plumbers, lawyers, clerks, um, all sorts of people who have nothing to do with politics. And those people are 
did not, not that anyone asked for this, but they have nothing to do with politics. So they especially didn't ask for something like this. And I think a lot of those folks, police officers included, I don't want to disclude police officers here, um, they are particularly scarred, I would say. And I think a lot of the press corps, a lot of my colleagues, a lot of our colleagues, Amish, people that all of us on this panel know quite well are, are very scarred by the incident. The Capitol is the citadel of democracy, Mish. You know that, you covered it. We've all covered it at different times in our career. I've just never been able to escape it. Um, and I, I think that it, it's something that will linger with the institution for a long time. I mean, I'll never forget just the sense of security that I had in the building, a building that I've worked in for uh, almost 15 years, uh, 12 years, has been um, completely uh, pierced. I used to say to people that the Capitol is a safe place, don't worry about me, and I, I no longer could really say that because I don't have any, I don't have have any evidence that that's, that's the case anymore. Now the building is safe, but still, that veil of security that we all had uh, is gone. And I think, listen, I think that we're in an unusual and an unusually dangerous time in our politics and especially our legislative politics. And I think a lot of that is a fallout from January 6th. And I think the thing that stuck with me about this week is that the um, Republicans really ceded the stage to Marjorie Taylor Greene and Matt Gates two people, two mem relatively new members of Congress whose views are, uh, I would say, not representative of everybody in the conference. But Kevin McCarthy didn't even issue a statement on January 6th. He wasn't in the building. Mitch McConnell was at a funeral, his former colleague Johnny Isaacson. So listen, I, I, it's a very difficult day, but re Republicans didn't really acquit themselves well uh, on January 6th. Yeah, and you, as you said, it's an unusually dangerous time. Carol, I want to come to you. You began immediately reporting about how the rioters broke and the security issues. What have we learned about the possible role of lawmakers, the former President Trump, what, what role they could have played in all of this sort of, 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 of this attack and, and this breach of security? That's right. I, I immediately got, began getting texts from all my law enforcement sources that day. I was actually on leave, book leave, ironically, and immediately, obviously, had to come off leave. One of the texts that, that sort of jolted me was, Carol, call me right now. Shots fired in the Capitol. I, I really had no idea. Um, what we've learned in the year since, Yamish, which is so important, so much. Uh, first, through great reporting by all of the people on your panel, great book reporting, great uh, investigative work that has uncovered things that the January 6th committee is now concretizing and corroborating, right? Um, they are making it admissible evidence, essentially. And so is the FBI. Here are some things we learned. Donald Trump was sitting on his hands for more than two and a half hours, uh, watching at first gleefully as his supporters broke through a police line, uh, as they took bear spray and uh, two-way radios and other weapons and began tromping through police and attacking them and moving on to the Capitol. His only reaction of concern came when he realized things had gotten very, very violent and shots had been fired. Those were the shots of a Capitol Police uniform officer shooting a woman who is breaking through the glass into Speaker Pelosi's lobby um, when Speaker Pelosi was still right behind that glass. Uh, that's when President Trump became concerned that this didn't look so good. Now we know multiple lawmakers who say this was just a tourist holiday, this was just a calm group of people who, who wanted to support the president and wanted to defend democracy, it wasn't violent. Now we know all of them were quietly, privately texting President Trump's chief of staff, begging him to get the president to call off the dogs, telling him things had gone too far and that the violence was frightening the lawmakers who literally were running for their lives. Um, we've also yeah. learned that close allies of, of President Trump's were in contact with some of the people who are charged with the most grievous events on this day, conspiracy. Um, and, and, and that's... And, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Well, I just want to go quickly to, to Zolan. We're, we're going to talk about, of course, about sort of the GOP and, and the shifting tone there. But Zolan, really quickly, President Biden came out, forceful rebuke um, of, of President Trump. He used words like defeat and loss and failure. What are you hearing from the White House about the decision to do that and also the action moving forward? Well, what we saw yesterday was a shift. 
Um, look, the president, since he's come into office, he has condemned what happened on January 6th. He has criticized the policies of his predecessor. But it was just last month that the White House press secretary, when pressed on why they didn't respond to each of the statements of misinformation coming from the former president, said that they didn't want to amplify, provide him a platform. They want to focus on the president's agenda. The president came in and was focused on unity and calculated in a way that with a return to normalcy, that the divisions that Trump stoked and Trump would be, fade away. Well, it didn't happen. Those divisions are still throughout the United States of America, from the halls of Congress to school board meetings. So there was a decision made yesterday by the White House and by the president who was involved in that speech yesterday. And what he was basically saying to his team is he didn't just want to be about criticizing the mob that stormed the Capitol, but also specifically those that enabled the mob to storm the Capitol, yeah. and specifically yeah. former President Trump. And that's what you saw yesterday. Now, in terms of what we see going forward, you know, I've talked to folks that have said when it comes to this topic, you may hear that tone. But whether or not we're going to hear it in other areas, whether or not you can expect him to continue to respond to each and every written statement that comes from the former president, I, I don't know about that at this point. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to turn now to, of course, the Republican attempts to whitewash January 6th, something that we already touched on in some ways. There's been a significant shift in tone among the GOP as time has passed. Former Vice President Mike Pence, who was personally targeted during the attack, has sought to downplay it. Here's what he said on that day and what he said more recently. And as we reconvene in this chamber, the world will again witness the resilience and strength of our democracy. For even in the wake of unprecedented violence and vandalism. I know the media wants to distract from the Biden administration's failed agenda by focusing on one day in January. And Ryan, I want to come to you. You loved the Capitol. You shared some moving photos of the Capitol after this attack because you wanted to go visit and say, and you said, see what these what these people had done to, 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 to the headquarters of Congress. Talk a bit about what you hear from your sources about the shift in messaging, though, on the GOP, of the GOP, um, and, and really, the, frankly, the fear that a lot of these lawmakers have of the former President Trump wanting to stay in his good graces. Yeah, you know, I think that everyone sort of going around what the facts of the case were. That day, there was this more unison about what ha indeed happened on January 6th, but that has really shifted over time. And I think as these cases go forward, as this FBI investigation moves forward, what you're going to see for the next two years, three years, four years, even five years, is this constant drumbeat of cases that remind us of what happened that day and remind us of what it was inspired by. Robert Scott Palmer, who has been sentenced to the longest sentence uh, in connection with the January 6th attack thus far, he was a really big Trump supporter. We called him 12 days um, after he was arrested, 12 days after we uh, contacted him back in March. And, you know, you look through his Facebook feed and it's everything you would expect someone who stormed the U.S. Capitol because they believed the lies about the stolen election to believe. It was it was just like a, it was textbook. Right. Everything in there was exactly what you would expect someone which would be sharing. And he's someone who went up and then threw, uh, he used a, 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 a fire extinguisher on police as they were under attack. He, he sprayed them with it, and then he chucked that at police. Um, and that's what he did because he thought the election was stolen. And I think that that's going to be, going forward, what the narrative is going to be, this constant reminder and a political inconvenience for Republicans to be reminded that this is what those lies did. Mm. Um, this is what these lies did. And while some 700 people have been charged, that's only a fraction of the people who were involved in the attack that day. Um, Jake, there, of course, is this January 6th investigation going on with lawmakers. What is, what's coming next on that front? And I, I wonder where, 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 in some ways, where this might be heading past the report that's supposed to be out, I think, before the, the, the November midterms. Is there anything else that we expect to come out of this? Well, we expect public hearings in the next let's call it uh, uh, two to three months, and it'll be interesting to see how they structure those public hearings, who they get to uh, to testify, what kind of case they try to build publicly about that day 
in the Capitol. I, I have to, there's a couple things to point out here, Yamish. Number one, a lot of uh, hay and a lot of news is being made about the people who are subpoenaed, who have been subpoenaed and compelled to testify to the committee and speak to the committee. But the larger point here is the White House, the Trump White House, has several people, many former aides to Donald Trump, are participating in this investigation and, and helping the committee plan. Uh, kind of chart out this, uh, what was going on that day behind the scenes. And a lot of us have reported that Donald Trump was uh, watching TV and kind of, I don't know about enjoying, but taking in the scenes, let's say. Uh, they'll need a little bit more than that. And I think that they have a lot more than that. I think Liz Cheney and Benny Thompson, the top two lawmakers on this committee, have a good deal of information about what Donald Trump was doing that day, what was going on in the Capitol, what Mark Meadows was up to. They have text messages that Mark Meadows turned over to the committee before he stopped participating. So I think you'll see two things. I think you'll see some sort of interim report in the next five months. I think in the next seven to nine months, you'll see a larger report about what they know about that day. And again, there's not a ton. I mean, we, we overcomplicate this a little bit. There's not a ton of ambiguity here in on the basic facts of the case. Donald Trump had a rally at the White House. He spoke. He told people to go to the Capitol. He previously said, get wild. People went to the Capitol and got wild. It drives me absolutely crazy when people say it was tourists and they were behaving and it was calm. I was there. They weren't behaving. They weren't tourists and they weren't calm. I mean, it's complete nonsense. And um, getting into some of the funding streams, who knew about this, who in the government was talking to these folks? I mean, you look at these images. I I've been working the Capitol every day of my life for 12 years. I've never seen tourists break through windows at the on the on the West Front where that is. It's, I mean, I know exactly where that is. This is a main hallway on the first floor of the Senate side of the Capitol. It's just astounding that people could be so stupid to say that it was calm and it was was tourists. It's, it's almost laughable. Yeah, and, and Zolan, something that sticks out to people, of course, is how this group of people were treated versus Black Lives Matter protesters. This, that, talk a little bit about what we've learned about who these people are, the DOJ's plans for try to, to try to hold this majority white um, crowd of rioters responsible for this and how that is in some ways informing how they may interact with protesters in, in the future when we think about Black Lives Matter protesters who have been met with violence at times for protesting peacefully. No, absolutely. I, I just want to also say the point Jake just made as well about some of the misinformation around that day, also a direct factor in the speech that you saw yesterday for the president as well, given the, the fueling some of the frustration in the White House just around some of the whitewashing that has been done about that day. But in terms of the juxtaposition around, around the treatment uh, as well, absolutely. Look, I was there. I covered most of the protests throughout last year. Um, in Washington, I was there in June when, uh, when, when you know, the former president uh, took a photo op and had rows of of federal agents, whether it be Bureau of Prisons, Customs and Border Protection, you know, HSI. I mean, uh, there was there was a alphabet soup of federal uh, agencies that were deployed for Black Lives Matter protesters last year. I remember when a Black Hawk helicopter came was on top. When I looked up and saw it in downtown Washington. Um, here, however, um, you had a different situation. The, it ex that day, January 6th, now we're talking about, exposed one intelligence failures. There was a glaring lack of, the reporting has shown, lack of preparation as well. Um, and you can notice that. And now with the committee investigation coming out, you're starting to see what uh, a, 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 you're starting to see some of the evidence around the disparate treatment of those two groups. You can point to some of the emails that the committee did get from Mark Meadows messaging an organizer that was there on January 5th, wanna make the distinction between the 5th and the 6th, but sending an email saying, look, the National Guard will be there uh, uh, you know, to protect pro-Trump people as well. You should also remember that uh, earlier when it came to Black Lives Matter protesters, that aligned with the former president also trying to align his reelection campaign with uh, being the law and order president to crack down on any sort of uh, disorder as well, even if he was conflating peaceful protesters with those that were actually committing any sort of crime. So the, there, there's more and more evidence coming out of that disparate treatment. Yeah. And, and Ryan, you've been looking into the online sleuths that have been turning a lot of these rioters into the FBI. Talk a little bit about their work and who the average rioter we've learned is. Yeah, I mean, they've really done an impressive work of sort of 
putting this, the pieces of this puzzle together, some of these affidavits that we see come out for the FBI are essentially ghostwritten by average Americans who have put together all of these uh, in, information from the internet, essentially open source dossiers to be able to make really rock solid cases against a number of these defendants. Some of them it's pretty easy because they you know put everything out on social media, but a lot of this, there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes there. Um, and you, know, you were putting some images up earlier about the attack. And when I look at those, I see a number of people who haven't been charged yet. Um, some of them in that crowd have been identified, dozens in fact, who are on the FBI's list and been solidly identified by SLUS but haven't yet been arrested. So there's a really long path ahead on these cases. And then you talk about just the people who went inside the Capitol building that day. The total universe there is almost at 2,400 at this point. So the total spectrum of cases we could see is around 3,000. So that's really what the FBI is measuring against when they talk about these 700 arrests we've seen so far, 3,000 is the total number here. So again, a really long pathway ahead here. That is incredible how many people still have not been charged or ha have been held accountable. Um, I also want to turn now to talk about sort of the future of democracy and, and, and voting, frankly. Um, a new poll found that a year out of the attack, 64 percent of Americans across party lines believe that our democracy is at risk of failing. In at least 19 states, Republicans have passed laws that will restrict voting. In response, Democrats in Congress, including Senator Raphael Warnock of Georgia, are trying to pass laws that they say will protect voting rights. Here's what he had to say on Tuesday. Our democracy is imperiled and time is running out. This is a moral moment. And if we fail to protect the voices and the votes of the American people, then we have fallen way short of our responsibility as members of this body. Carol, you, of course, have been doing so much work on, on the people who have been working on the sort of behind-the-scenes move in the GOP movement um, to restrict voting. Talk about that, but also you told our producers that you're genuinely worried about democracy in America. I, I think that uh, Warnock has it exactly right, that we the democracy is imperiled. You know, as journalists, what, what are we looking for? We're looking to see where we should skate to where the puck is going to be. Not, we're not following the puck and chasing it. We want to get to where the puck is on the hockey field. Well, the puck right now, in my view, is all of the elections that are going to be held in 2022, where we're going to have midterms in which I would guess and estimate, based on the rhetoric, a lot of Republican officials at every level of, of the game, from dog catcher to you know senator, they're going to be saying, wait a minute, my election was rigged. It wasn't properly handled. The votes were stolen. And now I am refusing to accept this result. Imagine that, Yamish, happening in multiple states with multiple people. There, as I said once before, there aren't enough sandbags to sort of stop and stanch that, that flood. And it, it will begin to unravel what is the core of democracy, uh, us believing that uh, volunteers who man these locations, uh, career officials in counties and states who are hired experts in elections, that these individuals are not to be trusted to manage an election and do it fairly. Chris Krebs, who was at DHS responsible during Donald Trump's presidency for overseeing uh, improper interference in the election, made it clear that all of the conspiracy theories that were floating around after the November election were, were, were BS. And he made it clear that they, not only did he just think that, they had drilled down to monitor the election and determined palpably, demonstrably, that all those theories were false. But here we are, Miyamish, per your great question, facing a, a fall when we could have a lot of basically miniature Trump moments a lot of January 6 moments. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 Ryan, I have about a minute left. I'm going to try to split it between you and Jake, so I'm going to give you 30 seconds. She said, Carol just talked about miniature Trumps. At least 57 people, according to Politico, who played a role in January 6 are now running for office. What's that say about where we are in, in the state of things? 
Yeah, I mean, the defense is incredible. I think of uh, Melissa Carone, who actually was parodied on SNL and was behind, uh, beside Rudy Giuliani. She's running for office. It doesn't seem to be a setback. You know, uh, endorsing these lies and just spreading these lies across the country hasn't been a setback, unfortunately, in the, in the Republican Party, because so many people believe them. It's really frustrating, both about the lies about the stolen election and now the lies that we're seeing about January 6th itself. And Jake, 10 seconds, uh, you'll, this is an easy question for you. What is the likelihood that voting rights will be passed, that the filibuster will somehow be blown up or at least carved out for there to be some sort of voting rights issue passed? Minuscule, minuscule. Not gonna, probably not going to happen. Probably not going to happen. Well, you answered in the, in the two words, which gave us a little bit of time. But thank you so much to all of you. We'll have to leave it there tonight. Thank you to Zolin, to Carol, to Ryan and Jake for sharing your reporting. We will continue our conversation on the January 6th Capitol attack on the Washington Week Extra. Find it on our website, Facebook and YouTube. And also tune in to the PBS NewsHour on Monday for a look at a new effort to bridge the nation's political divide. And finally, one year later, I want to say my heart goes out to all of those people around the country who are still dealing with the trauma and pain of that day. It's up to all of us, of course, to protect democracy going forward. Thank you for joining us. I'm Yami Shalsendor. Good night from Washington.